Funding for the Hinckley Report is made possible in part by the Cleone Peterson Eccles Endowment Fund. Tonight on the Hinckley Report, our expert panel takes a behind the scenes look at the major power brokers that influence our state. How much of an impact does Utah have on the national stage? And how has it evolved over time? With big changes in our state's demographics, how has the balance of power shifted? And how has the power of celebrity affected our politics and our elections? Good evening and welcome to the Hinckley Report. I'm Jason Perry, director of the Hinckley Institute of Politics. Covering the week, we have Rich McKeon, co-founder of Levitt Partners, Mara Carabello, president of the Exoro Group, and Greg Hughes, former speaker of the Utah House of Representatives. Thank you for being here on this special episode of the Hinckley Report. The topic tonight is power. We're going to talk about who has it in the state of Utah, how they wield it, what they do with it. And I want to set the stage through this lens because the three of you are quite unique in Utah politics. Rich, uh, you are one of the great chiefs of staff for the governor, for Governor Mike Leva of the whole state of Utah. Not only did you work with him there, but also two federal agencies. Looking forward to your perspective. Mara, uh, through your job as the Exoro Group, you are the voice behind the power often. The, ones, the one person telling them what to say, how to frame the issues, that's power all by itself. And as the former Speaker of the House, uh, Greg Hughes, uh, you, you've wielded an enormous power in the state on the issues Utahns care about and continue to do so. I, I mentioned that because I want to use that lens today, the perspectives that you all have to talk about how Utah is impacting the national stage and how people get things done here. So let's start with some polling that the Hinckley Institute of Politics uh, did with the Deseret News. And it's about where Utahns think the power is. And let's, let's do this first one here uh, because the federal government, Rich, uh, has this first one. What level of government holds the, the most power? This is where Utahns are. 55 percent of Utah said it's the federal government, 39 percent said the state, and then smaller categories for others. What do you make of that? Would you have expected Utahns would say it's the federal government? I, I actually would expect that, and I feel like um, there's a lot of sentiment, particularly in the West, that the government interferes in too many places and too many things. And I think that is the genesis of a lot of political activity, is the resistance to, gov to, to what is seen as federal encroachment. Hmm. So, Mara, we always talk about, you know, the level of government that's closest to the people is the most impactful. But when you go through that lens of Utahns, they're looking at that federal government, maybe they're having the biggest impact Here's on things we I care love about. this question. One, power is used in the broadest term. So mm -hmm. I love that for a polling question. But remember, in that instance, uh, perception is power. So yeah. it's not actually, to your point, who impacts them the most. It's who they perceive to have the most power. So then we start to talk about who, we, who do we hear from the most. And often power and money are interchanged, right? As though they are the exact same thing. So I think we hear about taxation all the time. We hear about big issue regulations. Now what we do know is that local government probably impacts you more. You know, you probably feel it more than anything else. But the perception of power is as important mm -hmm as the actual articulation of power in our life. Mm -hmm. And I think that reflects a, per a perception, and that also reflects how much time we spend about talking about mm -hmm. entities. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I'm gonna touch on uh, what Rich and what Mara said. I do think that st our state, Utah, uniquely, feels the heavy hand of the federal government more so than other states would with how much federal land there is and the control of that land. And when you get off the Wasatch Front, you have counties with 90% federal land and the decisions mm -hmm. they make are impacting lives. And, the, and there is that sense. And now you're seeing in education issues that people look to an office of education. But I'll also tell you that the perception part is the talking heads at night, what people are watching, or how they're getting their news and their content. As I was a public servant, the constituents I would speak with, um, the narratives always followed the national narratives. Of, of politics and the Republicans and Democrats and what they were grappling over and less about what we were grappling as a state or a state legislature. So I think that it's both. I think there's a perception and I think that when you see the national conversation going on, people gravitate to that, they're paying attention to it. Uh, and then I also think that Utahns have a unique 
and and act and sometimes adversarial relationship with the federal government in terms of its uh, power or what it can do uh, to the residents of our state. But Jason, can I take that to talk about, you started out, you alluded to two questions, and one was, does Utah have any power nationally? And what I think is an interesting question of a small western state is that we have six total representatives. They often are very like-minded. Frankly, even if we have a Democrat in there, it's a moderated Democrat. And other states are fighting within their own delegations to receive power. And Utah, over the history of time, particularly in the 20s, 30s, 40s, and 50s, where the federal government was issuing mm -hmm. lots of capital money, we did enormously well. We have a ton of infrastructure that was done by persuasion of our federal delegation. And I think a small state that can stay together as a delegation and then have some longevity, yeah. we really do well, surprisingly, in the federal system. Mm -hmm. Rich, talk about how we do. You you are there. How are we perceived there? What kind of influence do we have? I think that Utah has created a unique, unique place for itself. First of all, we've had people who have stayed in the Senate for a long, long time. Yeah. Have uh, You take Orrin Hatch, for instance, who, who was the chair of the health, uh, health, edu health education, mm -hmm. labor and pension, finance and judiciary uh, over the course of time. And I think and during his last election term, the big ticket point was that he was going to be the chair of finance. Mm -hmm. And that was his, uh, that's why I should stay for another term. And I think that has helped. But I also think that Utah has taken many unique positions. For instance, I just remember the um, compact on immigration. Mm -hmm. I think it was a national statement. I think that the fairness for all became kind of a discussion point in the LGBT issues that be resonated with people as a fair solution, at least a place for mm -hmm. a talking point there. And and I think we've taken a unique place in the country that way. Mm -hmm. Mara, I'm curious about how that plays out because we, we do talk about it a lot in our political circles. There is a Utah way, you know, we punch above our weight uh, in Washington, D.C. And th th these sound really great. I'm kind of curious how you see that play out, though, because there is a Utah way. We have a way we approach it. But is it received well in Washington, D.C. to the point that it's actually changing policy or hearts or minds? You know, I think the discipline of that does well. I don't know that Utah has the power of numbers there, but we're good at coalition building. Mm -hmm. And we're good, and coalitions have power. Consistent, constant coalitions have power. I will tell you, I think the Utah way falls apart a little from a power brokering situation at the state level. I think we talk about the Utah yeah. way, and then the real politic is yeah. we are navigating and brokering power in a non-cohesive way behind the scenes quite often. Yeah, but, but Greg, will you please talk about that? Because you had to do that, right? Yeah, You're exporting right. the Utah way. Not here, yeah. but also sort of the evangelist for it uh, out there in the community around the, around the country. So we took trips back to, to Washington, D.C. in front of stakeholders um, and different groups uh, describing our challenges and how those challenges relate maybe across the country. I don't think the, the climate in Washington is static. I think it's getting worse, and I think it is becoming more dysfunctional as you're watching uh, an inability to make hard decisions and an inability to spend political capital, be it the legislative branch or your executive branch. And so I don't know that we are able to translate what we do here as effectively, especially when we lose uh, some of that seniority. But I will tell you this. Um, we do have uh, parties, we have platforms, we have different approaches to different issues. But we also have a lot of common ground where we find solutions together. We re it's not just, it's, I know that sounds flowery and everything else, but there are, we have thoughtful policymakers and leaders who do come together and, and you can spot common ground. It's not as, um, as strident as I think people are led to believe federally when you look at Washington. Uh, we problem solved all the time and I think we can get we can take care of Utah, but how that translates to Washington, I see less and less of what Washington is doing that resembles anything that we try to accomplish as a state here in Utah. Mm -hmm. uh, let me give you another polling question, and Mara, if, you, if you'll do this one, because um, we're going to need a response from Greg and Rich on this one also, because we talked about uh, leaders at that state level, and we asked what leader or group has the most influence in Utah? And this is interesting, because I'm curious, historically, 36% uh, of Utah said the governor, 51% said the legislature. Right. That's unusual, a little bit. I mean, often 
the governor because part of their job is to show vision and have a platform. Um, the legislature has been incredibly active and aggressive. We've had a couple of ballot measures that right. talked about, hey, can they call themselves into session? Do they have more autonomy? We've had executives who are willing to get along and at the face, and remember, the topic today is power. So at the face of it, it sounds really good if the executive branch gets along, but it is hard to control the legislative branch <laughs> and they suck all the air out of the room. I think you see that in our perception of where the power lives is a lot of the bold moves, a lot of the social conversations that we're having mm -hmm. are originating from the legislature. Yeah, go ahead. I just say, I wonder if to, to a certain degree, if that polling question were asked at various times during yeah. the year, you would have a very different response. Yeah. I mean, yeah. there are times when governors participate much more openly and freely. And mm -hmm. when the legislature is uh, active, it really has an impact, I think, uh -huh. on, on the news that's out there. Yeah, I want to get to the timing of this one in just a moment, but maybe a follow up to you, because one thing that you helped Governor Levitt do uh, very effectively at the time was the, the power of the pulpit, uh, the, the being able to go around the state, be that one statewide elected official. How did you um, sort of instruct, you know, instruct might be the right way, sort of counsel him to use that power? Well, I think he used it in a way that really bothered the legislature, for instance. I mean, you, know, you probably remember, Greg, that when he would go out, when he'd roll out the budget, he wouldn't just roll out the budget. He would do 15 events at different uh -huh. places. He would control the narrative. He would be way out in front. And it put the it put the legislature back in the sense that they felt that they had to be reactive to it as opposed to participatory with it. Mm -hmm. But that was his way of, of kind of managing that and moving it forward. And it was extremely, I think, effective in garnering yeah. support for the initiatives that he was proposing. Yeah. Uh, go and respond, please. Well, look, I think there's an. I think it is by design to be a healthy balance, equal and separate powers of a legislative branch and executive branch. In the past, because you have by design our state constitution, one of the shortest general sessions in America. Thirty. We say, always say 45 calendar days, but it amounts to I think 31 work days, Monday through Friday. Um, we are a growing state. And I can tell you that the workload of, of citizen part-time lawmakers is becoming a daily mm -hmm. effort as we've grown and, and, and those challenges just keep coming forward. You don't have enough time in those 31 days to grab, to learn, be introduced mm -hmm. to, learn and, under, and try to solve those problems. You're working all the time. And so the state's growing. My first budget when I arrived in 2003 was $7 billion total. It's what, 25 billion mm -hmm. at this point? So I, I will say that it, it makes sense to me that you're going to see a legislative branch with the power of the purse, exercising that appropriately, balancing budgets, um, holding the executive branch accountable, uh, being introduced to issues, maybe unintended consequences or uh, different parts of the state that are grappling with things. And they are just drilling in. And I think it speaks well of our legislative branch that they aren't shirking that responsibility, that they're putting that time in. But it would be natural to say that you're feeling that or seeing or observing a stronger legislative branch now than you would have 30 years ago. I want to insert here. So there's a very famous quote for all the political junkies by George Will, the columnist, in which he asserts that the only way to keep power is to use it. I mean, that's a paraphrase. But he talks about power gets perpetuated by the use of power. And I think that that's what you're both speaking to. Levitt used it. He, it was an active yeah. thing for him. Right now, the legislature is actively using their power. And that use of it, whether that's in speech, setting agendas, doing budgets. I mean, there's that difference between what you're assigned to do under your job description mm -hmm. of being elected and using your power. Yeah. You're seeing a legislative branch now that is absolutely using its power to its benefit. And, and look, pension reform. We were one of the first states, and this is like 12 years ago, to say that, that we have un, you know, we, we don't have, we have unsecured liabilities of pensions to state workers uh, because we had defined uh, benefits, not contributions. Mm -hmm. It took a state senator, a dogged state senator that took more than one session to say we're going to go to a defined contribution. This country has followed that example. But that came from a, a lawmaker who was adept at these issues and worked very, very hard. And you see lawmakers, and it, I think it's the individual leadership of particular lawmakers, that step forward into certain spaces, because we're citizen legislatures, we have different experiences, and they are leading out. And they are spending that political capital. But frankly, I, I think that's a good system. I mm -hmm. think it's one where you're getting a swath of people with different experiences, different expertise, and then leaning into those issues that they're seeing uh, and trying to interrupt the status quo. So a new political power that we see emerging more and more is this 
the media, so yeah. social media, Absolutely. and are you going at being popular more? I'm now coming still from the lawmaker's point of view. Are, are you concerned more that you have followers and things? What I don't like about that new power pressure is that I think great leaders who use their power well, like Mike Levitt, they were also risk takers. And really good power takes risks. That gets a little tempered when you're looking at your social media stream to find out if you're popular yeah, or not. Yeah. That's, that's true. Rich, how has that changed? Because we see this interesting sort of kind of movement back and forth. Our politicians become celebrities. Celebrities decide they're going to be politicians. And whether or not, how you've seen that evolved and how much power is there in the number of followers you have? So, so this is not a world that I grew up in politically. But the evolution of, I think, creates its own kind of risk, and that is the risk to be too early, too wrong. And we see people in retraction mode consistently who, who are out there. They, they make statements in order to mm -hmm. cover themselves under a headline, but then they are in the wrong place ultimately. And I think it is kind of a risky place to be. Um, and I don't see that as consistent with the exercise of power. I see that as an exercise of self-aggrandizement of some kind and not one that is, you know, this isn't, people aren't using this to, to, to uh, forecast and to put forward agendas. They're doing it in response to events that are around mm -hmm. them. At least that's how I see so, it. Mara, do people distinguish it? No, I think mean, it's getting more and more blurred, right? And who should have speech? You, uh, you know, we saw, um, Taylor Swift put out something. She, she's been nonpartisan, but she put out something for vote.org telling yes. people to go vote. That's great. The, the data I heard is that several hours later, 45,000 people had already registered to vote. Leonardo DiCaprio used his platform the other day to talk about the Great Salt mm -hmm. Lake. Um, these aren't policy people. It doesn't mean they're not doing good things. Yes. I think it is toxic for elected officials to begin to spend yeah. more time on their popularity than on being bold yeah. decision makers. Yeah, uh, Greg, you're so good on w w what brand is too. <laughs> so it, it's, I'm just kind of curious because yeah. you start seeing these elected officials that seem like they're building their own brand. I mean, there's the one thing you would say, I would do this because I have a political sort of brand, my policies. It seems like we have many that are a little different. So as, as social media emerged and became more and more a part of uh, everybody's life, but certainly those uh, public servants, um, I think some felt almost in a defensive mode. I better start telling my story a little bit more because if, if, I, if I don't define myself, someone else will. Um, but here's the, here is the, the cancer in, in leadership, if there is one, that social media will feed. If I want to get reelected, I don't want to make anyone mad. Mm -hmm. And the best way to make to not make anyone mad is to do nothing, to convene, to talk, to share rhetoric, but without any hard decisions behind that. Because if you make a hard decision, if you interrupt the status quo, you know, if you've been around, that you're going to upset people. People are going to be angry at you. There is no uniformly embraced and celebrated difficult policy decision to make. If there was, they've already done it. So if you want to spend political capital and you want to do the hard things, then the, then the backlash and the criticism is inherent to that. Social media makes that a lot, lot more difficult for a lot of people in their calculus mm -hmm. on what they're going to do because it's immediate. It's not, it's not the news cycle you have to live through. It's, it's, the, it's the people that are attacking you and it feels uh, to a person in any setting, whether it's politics or anything else, that this is real time, this, this feedback is real. And so that is having, I think, a very negative effect on true leadership or the heavy lifts that leadership requires. Wow, so Mara, it's just so easy for those elected officials, and I talk to them, to live in this space where the like button you know, is going up or down, and that's how I kind of gauge where my power is. We're seeing more and more elected officials who are spending time on their celebrity. Mm -hmm. We're seeing just like easy examples of that are elected officials who have two and three and four staff members that are just around their public relations and their PR. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I question that a little bit and I think it is stopping some hard decisions. It's interesting though, because let's just give the quick side of why one does it. It's a great communications channel. Yeah, so it it, like as with everything, it's yeah. not a good or a bad, yeah. it's a well, how is it influencing? Mm -hmm. Uh, let's talk about a couple other uh, sort of power centers, Rich, because uh, the population of the state of Utah continues to rise. Talk about what's happened there. Uh, we have most of our population, 75 percent uh, is along the Wasatch Front, but rural Utah, particularly in the most recent special election, showed that maybe we're seeing some power forces evolving in rural Utah. 
Not only are they evolving, it seems like they, they had a significant impact on this result of the result of the Malloy election. Yes, yeah, Malloy, right. The, um, you know, I think the, the, the concepts here that are in, intriguing to me, at least, and I'm kind of following on some of what Mara just talked about, is that I, I, I was involved in a world where we created a vision of where we wanted to go. We began to plot where we thought there were yeah. corners were going to be that we needed to make turns and twists. We created plans that were available for people to look at. We executed on them. And I don't, it seemed to me that that, that kind of vision created a control. It, can, it showed where people were going to go, and they could respond to it effectively one way or the other. And I, the differential right now that I see is that much of this is done in the way of social media. I'm not seeing the big plan, and we've got plenty of big plans. You mentioned demographics. By 2060, we double the population, basically. I think we go to about 5.5 million people. That's a staggering sum for a western state that's already short on water. Yeah. I mean, there are so many things that we have that are yeah. important issues that require leadership and the coalition uh, to bring people together of multi-sector mm -hmm. interests to, to solve those problems. Mm -hmm. It's universally agreed on that we're going to double or we're in the process of doubling. What's so intriguing about that from a power perspective is that level of quick growth sets up different power structures. So whether it's geographic or whether it's a changing demographic, mm -hmm. what we've yeah. seen next is we're not as homogenous as we used to be. That statement is not about out-of-staters either. We're just not as homogenous. You're seeing differences yeah. in opinions on age and gender more. I don't think this is bad, but you're going to see some traditionalists, all of us who have lived here for too long, we're like, hold on, we like what we have. So power yeah. structure around change and growth, as Rich suggested, hits policy issues yeah. like water, but it's going to hit a lot of cultural issues as yeah. well. Greg, this happened to you as speaker. It did. I, I'll tell you, you have to have, as Rich described, you have to have, you have to understand the long range plan of your, your state and where it's going. Um, it, it, uniquely, if you've got 75% of your state out of 29 counties only living in four of them along the Wasatch Front in a valley that can't just sprawl forever. Uh, when we say we're going to double, how would we think, how do we even think that's going to happen? And how does that relate to the rest of the states and its counties? But then at the same time that you're trying to look forward like that, you have issues that are coming up in real time um, that are impacting you uh, that, that we, ha we don't have jail space. We don't have people entering the profession to have people that we can uh, incarcerate or detain because we're, you'll have issues that are coming to you in real time that you have to be able to respond to. So in the same meeting, you may have to be proactive and reactive with the information being brought to you and they might relate to one another. But you can't be one or the other, at least as the state is right now and the way things are coming at us. Um, it, you have to, a good leader is one that has good information, drives good decisions. You're getting as much of it as you can, but you have to be willing to take a risk. You can't just take on the fights you think you're going to guaranteed win. Um, but you better understand that larger plan as well and how it fits with the decisions you're being asked to made, make. And that's a, that's, that's a lot. That's a lot to do. It is a lot to do. It, it, it makes me wonder, uh, kind of as we get to the, the last few minutes here, how do we keep this power in check? We as the voters, you all have been to other sides, so I'm kind of curious what your thoughts were, uh, the things that you heard from the public that helped, the things that helped shape where, the direction you were going to take. You know, we, we talked a little, I mean, we've kind of had this conversation over the course of time, and that is the good fortune of living in a community where we have people who have resources who are willing to contribute mm -hmm. to the good of the community. Yeah. And, and there is a power structure that exists upon the, in the private sector to culturally enrich, to bring sports teams, to, uh, mm -hmm. to do things that change and solidify our community. And I think that we ought to give credit to them for the, for the power that they utilize in a very affirmative and positive way. Uh, uh, Mar, you're an expert at mobilizing the business community. Well, so coalitions and relationships matter. So if I were talking to someone who had power and they were talking about how to keep it, someone who has power or wants to grow their power, I would say the key is take the meeting. I mean, that's too simplified. But I have never, the most powerful people I know, interestingly enough, always take the meeting. So that may be with, with their associates, but they always take the meeting. They stay open to hearing and relevant. If you wanted power, if you were someone who was petitioning for power, the flip side of that conversation is, I would say, make the relationship. Start to reach out. Coalitions, networks, and I'm not talking about inside baseball, 
you know, generational good old boy. I'm saying relationships matter. Utah does that. Our philanthropic and business community reaches out to our governmental entities and forms partnership. So if you want to keep power, keep taking the meeting, don't become uh -huh. arrogant. If you want power, build the relationship. Uh -huh. And I think that this, this same group is willing to, to the, the, these groups are willing to bring together all of the players, not just some of the players. And I think that's a critical part of this as well, is that Utah listens, I think, to what people have to say. Mm -hmm. uh, Greg, as the Speaker of the House, talk about in our last minute, what impacted you, moved you the most? I know you were the one that did take the meetings. Yes, I, so look, there's a, you can get disconnected very quickly. My wife would point this out all the time. When the session starts and I would come home, um, you're, you're just, you're using acronyms about different things that and you, you can get, you can, it can be insular uh, when you're busy and you're trying to get things done. The one thing I would say is even those that are our, our institutional wealth and our, our donors and our uh, philanthropists, they have an incredible voice and they're so important. However, um, they're not, they're not accountable to the people. And you, you cannot be in any just given camp. You better make sure that you are listening to those that sent you. It's a democratically elected republic. If at any point those that you represent think that you're the voice or you're working for someone other than them, uh, there's a consequence for that and there should be. So how you balance that, how you're making sure you're communicating what you're trying to work on, working with your stakeholders to make sure you can get good things accomplished. But I will tell you, I think there's a movement even nationally where people feel like they've been left behind by politics and, and power brokers. We have got to make sure that that conduit of communication is not just pageantry and social media, but that there is a sincere yeah, uh, communication. Will, and that's that's a full-time gig. That does, our, that's our not easy to do. Greg will tomorrow. expect this of us. It's not just elected officials, people who have power. People have power. Companies have power. Philanthropists have power. Don't always look to the electeds. That's and the very initiative good. process reinforces it's that. So good. We could go all night. Thank you so much <laughs> for your great insights. And thank you for watching The Hinckley Report. This show is also available as a podcast on pbsutah.org slash Hinckley Report or wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you for being with us. We'll see you next week.